Welcome back. We are on chapter eight, where we're talking about product services, products and services, as well as branding. Again, how to create customer value. That's always going to be the, the foundation principle or objective in terms of what we're looking at here. So we're going to talk about the things that distinguish, we're going to define products and services, and, and then also talk about some of the things that distinguish products from services. And we'll talk about some of the product and service decisions when it comes to uh, strategy. And then we'll get specifically into services marketing and how that is different from traditional product marketing. And then we'll delve into more brand and brand strategy. Now, chapter eight will be done in two parts, parts one and two. Uh, we'll probably take it up to the branding portion for part one. And then we'll continue part two uh, where we will actually look at branding specifically. So formally, just in terms of uh, a definition, is anything that can be offered in the market for attention, acquisition, use, consumption that might satisfy a need or a want. Again, the, the key point is providing some kind of benefit that is satisfying a need or a want. A service, on the other hand, is more of an experiential uh, kind of interaction. Um, so it could be activities. Essentially, these are the intangible things. The traditional thing that we think about with a product, it is tangible. Services generally are intangible. There are a few exceptions. For example, when we look at um, you know, calling cards or, or debit cards, things of that nature, where there is a physical component to it. But by and large, when we think of services, they are intangible. Think of airline services, dry cleaning services, educational services. There are some things that make them more tangible by way of the, the, the bedding that they might have in the Ritz-Carlton or the piano bar that they might have in the Four Seasons Hotel. Those types of things make it a little bit more tangible. But, but by and large, it's an interaction or an experience across individuals across consumers and service providers, as well as interactions um, amongst consumers. So again, it's these experiences that we're talking about. So we're talking about an experience that might be a continuum. So for example, we go in and check in in the hotel, we're gonna have a variety of discrete experiences for that hotel stay, from the actual check-in to dealing with the uh, service staff when it comes to room service or having them clean the room or if we're using the workout facilities, all those are interactions that eventually kind of sum up to the total of the experiences that you get uh, by using the service. So, so generally, when we, we talk about products and marketing, we kind of organize it into this layered kind of approach of which the, the middle one uh, called the, the core customer value, which is sort of like the underlying benefits that we're getting. And then we talk about those things that kind of layer over it. Uh, where it kind of tangibilizes these benefits in the, in the form of a name. Uh, so a brand name would, would actually be there. So the core benefit for a automobile might be transportation, but the brand name we might have is a Toyota. And some of the features might include having a satellite um, radio capability, or it might have a diesel engine. Um, obviously the design, we can think about the physical look of it in terms of aerodynamics, how it allows us to go fast. Um, obviously the quality level that, that we're talking about can then be multi-layered where it looks at different aspects of quality. So it could be reliability, it could be design, it could be the aesthetics of it. And products that have packaging, be it a box or a container, uh, that's all going to go into part of the actual product. And surrounding that is going to be what we call the augmented product. And typically these are things that happen more um, at the very end of the sale or after sale. So all the warranties that we might have, the product support, customer service stuff, the actual delivery and setup, if we're talking about buying a bed or furniture, maybe some after service care where people may come in and do minor repairs to the product that you purchase. So you can think about someone coming in and doing an adjustment to your washing machine or to your refrigerator. Something happens after the actual uh, purchase and delivery. So a product 
in the context of consumers, I think we're all aware of them. We call them and distinguish them from industrial products. So consumer products, and then we have industrial products. And these consumer products are obviously the ones that we buy day to day. And I think just like the chapter where we talked about uh, organizational buying, industrial products are those products that are used as an input or raw material to an end product that will be sold to consumers. Now, now, marketers have, have oftentimes organized products and classified them into four general categories of products. And we'll take them one at a time. Excuse me, a convenience product. I mean, these are the products that we frequently buy. They're relatively inexpensive. Some of them are impulse items, newspapers, candies, you know, fast food. So relatively little cost. Take it back to the stuff that we talked about. Uh, I think it was in one of the previous chapters, but we talked about the involvement level by way of time, energy, um, uh, emotion. These are typically going to be your low involvement kinds of products where we pretty much know what kind of brand we're going to select uh, within a certain range. And usually they're all pretty much priced around the same. A pack of gum is a pack of gum. They're all going to be around $1.25 or $1.50 these days. But by and large, some of us will choose a certain brand because it has a better flavor. Some of us may choose it because it, it has no sugar in it and, and it might be better for us. Um, so again, very convenient in the way it's distributed. Very, very low price types of products. Now, the next category is what we would, would call shopping goods here. Um, so these are going to be products and services that we, we compare very carefully. Again, we kind of move into this high involvement uh, kind of category where we're looking for it to fit a certain style, a certain level of quality, a certain price. Uh, again, a little bit more energy, taking a little bit more time because generally speaking, they're going to be of higher price. So cars and appliances and furniture, things of that nature will all fall into this particular category. Specialty products, these are going to uh, be the ones uh, uh, that have some kind of unique characteristics um, where we have people who believe them to be special in some way. And we need to, to kind of find out what some of uni uniqueness, unique aspects of these are. So, for example, if you're looking to have knee surgery, um, we might find that we spend more time, very high involvement, ask more for recommendations. We were looking for people to, to really kind of tell us, um, you know, how good a physician is this particular person? What was your experience? What were some of the after effects of, of actually having knee surgery? Um, and again, highly correlated with cost, uh, designer clothing. Uh, people tend to spend a lot more for that type of stuff. Um, but you usually find them in more specialty oriented types of stores versus a general store. So that's where you would go to a Best Buy as an example for high end electronics or even a, a, um, a niche oriented local brand that only carries the best in terms of electronics. Or you go to a store that um, only caters to higher end designer types of clothing. So think about from the standpoint of what you purchase. Do you purchase any specialty products and what kinds of products are they? Again, usually more expensive, more exclusive distribution. And generally speaking, we spend more time um, searching out information uh, to make a decision as to what we should buy. The last category the what we would call unsought goods, and essentially these are things that we just don't know we need or want until we need them. So it's things like life insurance, uh, funeral services, um, blood donations. Uh, funeral services, I, I mean, I've unfortunately had to um, deal with some of this when my mom passed away, but you know, generally you don't really know that you need these services until something happens or, or you're reaching a point where you know someone um, maybe um, sick and will pass away. But most of us don't look at these services as something that we need until some life-changing event. Um, sometimes what happens is once people see that they've lost a loved one, then they go and they start seeking out life insurance. And so sometimes it might be a discrete event that happens that might trigger it. But a lot of times the, the trigger is going to be for that particular unsought good but sometimes searching for one unsought good, for example, funeral services, might trigger a particular need for other unsought services, for example, uh, life insurance. 
Now, contrasting that with industrial products. Industrial products, I'll admit industrial products are, are pretty boring and bland. And most people, when they think of industrial products, they think of ball bearings or they think of salt or some sort of uh, commodity that might be an input to an end product. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about the different classifications of, of different types of products. And remember, these are products that go into the production of an end result product uh, that consumers buy. And we classify them into three categories, capital items, material and parts, and supplies and services. The capital uh, types of items are more your, pro your plant and equipment types of uh, items. So for example, if you are looking to sell a, a new product and the current plant and equipment that you have is not suitable for it. So creating a new product line, you may have to go out and buy or retrofit existing equipment or go out and buy new equipment that satisfies that particular need. And so then the raw materials also too, those are the component parts that you might use or should use in terms of manufacturing the product. So we're talking about plant equipment, raw materials, and then the supplies are all the other things that people use and purchase when they just run their business. It could be copy paper, it could be staples and scissors and post-it notes and you know uh, maintenance items, anything that, that keeps the lights on in a building uh, or a plant and facility. Um, now, organizational marketing is, is, a, is another concept that we uh, frequently talk about in business-to-business -business kinds of relationships. These are going to be things like trade shows and trade publications. Again, very targeted to business buyers and business users, okay? Keep in mind, we're talking about right now business-to-business -business marketing. Um, not the sexiest of things. Um, it's not going to be as creative. Typically, if you look at an ad for a trade, or a trade publication, it's going to be very, very much objectively measurable types of items. Uh, it might give you specifications of the industrial product and how it might fit into the product that you manufacture. Um, you're not going to have a lot of uh, fancy promotion and advertising. Uh, that tries to, to, to prey on people's emotions. It's usually going to be something very concrete, very boring, very bland. This is how this particular raw material will help you make products that satisfy your customers' needs. Now, marketing in, in terms of people marketing, um, anytime we, we think about um, a person in their marketing. It's going to consist of uh, activities undertaken to create, maintain, and change attitudes or behaviors toward particular people. This is the, the stuff that we talked about in the previous chapter when it came to more target marketing. Um, it could be an endorsement that could come in that will hopefully allow you to, to actually connect with a particular uh, target market. Um, it could be a person, a, 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 an athlete, an entertainer who's actually trying to sell their services. It could be uh, an entertainer. It could be a politician. Um, all of these types of things are, are, are considered to be more, um, I guess, what we would call non-physical product, product kind of marketing. So it could be destination marketing, as an example. Um, tra uh, travel and tourism bureaus that are, are looking to target consumers um, to come and, and have a convention or people to come and, and take vacations in Las Vegas or New Orleans or whatever the city of choice is. Um, actually, it's, it's a very lucrative business because when we think about organizations and people and places, um, that usually brings a lot of economic impact into uh, local communities. The, the place marketing and social marketing, I think that the main point that I want to uh, talk about here is that when we think about place marketing, um, again, it talks about cities and states and regions. And, and again, it's about trying to sell destinations. So the I Love New York campaign, which is very popular, and it was very popular for the longest time, still very popular, 
I think Michigan is is going through a campaign now where they're trying to get people to to view Michigan as a a destination to live, come and start businesses. Uh, they talk about some of the lifestyle issues as far as the lakes are concerned there. Uh, also, too, I, I think we, we saw a lot after Hurricane Katrina where people were trying to get people to come back to New Orleans um, as a destination for conferences and conventions and vacations. Um, and it, it's, a, it's an uphill battle depending on the circumstances or, or situations. I know Detroit is going through specifically as a city trying to get people to uh, essentially invest and in, in travel there. And a lot of times we also use uh, social marketing. Um, there are many companies, Target is one of them, um, that provides millions and millions of dollars for local to local schools all around the country. And so they provide a certain percentage of their uh, revenue uh, that goes toward educational endeavors in a particular city where they do business, which is pretty much all around the country. So when we think about uh, selling products and services, we got to think about the groupings of decisions that need to be made when it comes to uh, actually selling products and services. So we have to figure out what are the product attributes that we're looking to uh, attribute to our particular brand? How do we want to position these attributes to, to essentially create a value proposition? So are the attributes related to the functionality of it? Is it something about the aesthetics of a particular product? Think about when you, you the last time you purchased a uh, piece of apparel and think about the attributes that you liked about that particular product. Was it the functionality? Was it the coloring, the, the design? Was it the way it fit? Um, and a lot of times it's, it's, it's kind of all the above here. Was it just the brand, the second one here? Uh, sometimes we, we buy the brand itself without really focusing on the attributes um, in more detail. But generally speaking, a brand itself should encompass all of these different things in, um, and represent all these different things in and of itself. And we'll, we'll talk about branding in the second part of this uh, module. Packaging, many times packaging is, can be very, very important um, because we look at packaging sometimes as more aesthetics, but sometimes it can be very, very functional in the way that we uh, actually use it. And uh, I, I need to have a couple more points. I'm going to skip ahead one slide here if I can, just to kind of sum up. We talked about style and design and some of the features and the quality of the different types of product attributes. But uh, I guess the point I was trying to get to um, relates more so to the, the different packaging and the different types of things that packaging might represent uh, when it comes to um, how we use and perceive a package. So for example, one of my, my favorite products that I use is a, an oral rinse called ACT, A-C-T, ACT. And ACT is a really great product, uh, but one of the things that they realized when they first brought the product out, it has a little receptacle um, at the top now. But before, it used to be just like if you purchased a bottle of Scope or Listerine, you'd open the cap and you essentially pour a measurement into like a Dixie cup and you'd use it. And what they found was that people weren't using it correctly. And so what they did was to develop a squeeze measurement based system for the product that measured out a perfect measure of one dosage or one usage. Because what they were finding is people were using it like it was Listerine and didn't see the value because they kept using it a lot quicker than they really should by using more and more each time. And so now that, that particular packaging is more of a functional packaging because it really helps to educate people on how to use the, the, the actual product. Well, a couple of the points I, I want to make here um, relates to product and product quality. Now, now product quality can mean a, a lot of different things to different people. Uh, but by and large, when we think about product and product quality, we're talking about products that have fewer defects. And so we're talking about quality control issues. 
Um, and many brands have been positioned in the marketplace based on their perceptions of quality or country of origin, uh, based on country of origin's perception of quality. So as an example, when we think about automobile manufacturers, people have the perception that the Japanese make a better, reliable car. And so there they look at more defects in American brands. Ford, for the longest time, had the worst reputation uh, when it came to the number of defects that they were seeing coming off the assembly line. And it got to the point where you know, it was a running joke in the industry, and you, and you saw it in terms of sales, where people just weren't buying American-made cars. They were buying German cars. They were buying Japanese cars. And now if you look at the automobile industry, there's a lot of competition from Korean uh, manufacturers, uh, still Japanese. American companies have made a comeback, which is really good. So at the, at the end of the day, the bottom line is we, we need to have good quality consistency in terms of you know what we actually um, manufacture. So once we decide to actually buy a product, we have to ask the question, what are some of the features of the products that we're actually buying? Um, and so as a marketer or a competitor or a manufacturer, Having features that are viewed as beneficial and different from competitors can potentially give you a competitive advantage. It may not be sustained, but you may find that um, the, the features that you do have on your particular product at some point will become standard in the industry. Uh, these days in automobiles, it's almost standard to have a GPS system of some sort. Uh, there was a time about 25 years ago or more where air conditioning was an option for automobiles. And so you had to pay extra. So it didn't come standard with air conditioning. Nowadays, you can't find a car that doesn't have air conditioning the same way you can't find a car that doesn't have a basic um, AM FM radio with a CD player. And even now, XM radio is pretty much standard in most of these automobiles. And keeping with the car theme as well, we have to ask the question, how does styling and design uh, have an impact in terms of uh, what we should include? Again, looking at it as a point of differentiation. Most people would probably argue in uh, apparel, styling and design is key. And it's all about the, the name brands of the fashion designers and the styling. And the styling oftentimes uh, needs to be uh, ahead of its time. Um, because as, as we know, style typically is something that's fleeting. What's stylish today might not be stylish tomorrow. And so for those people who manufacture um, fashion garments, they have to be cognizant of the fact that um, they have to continue to innovate and, and do things that are going to be interesting for people um, today as well as tomorrow. Now, in the next, uh, this is the end of part one of this chapter. The next chapter, we want to delve a little bit more into what branding is. And obviously, branding is something that we're all aware of, but it's a very important integral component of trying to market a product or a service. Because after all, a brand is a shortcut that connects to hopefully positive attributes that we're looking for in the products that we buy and sell. And so I'll catch you on the other side.